Welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com, the only podcast dedicated exclusively to poker tournament strategy. Now here's your host, Clayton Fletcher. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast. I'm your host, Clayton Fletcher, in fabulous, bucolic, gorgeous Cleveland, Ohio, where I am visiting some family and friends and getting some business done while I'm here in the great state of Ohio, the Buckeye State. Uh, If you have never traveled to America, uh, be sure to put Ohio on your list of states to possibly skip. Um, (laughs) I'm just kidding, but there's actually... Not that much going on here, but one thing that is going on here is the Jack Casino in Cleveland. Apparently, this company called Jack Gaming is a casino company that was started right here in Ohio, and now they have several locations. The Jack in Cleveland is the former horseshoe there where I had played many years ago and enjoyed it. And now I'm happy to announce they have recently renovated the poker room here in Cleveland, and it's quite nice. The dealers and players are, for the most part, pretty friendly. The action is mostly loose and passive. So if you're ever passing through the Midwest for any reason, I would recommend a stop in Cleveland and the Jack Casino. Those of you who have been following the podcast for a while know that it's pretty typical of me in August to visit family around the country after the World Series of Poker ends. And this year is no exception. I am trying to see everyone that I could not see all summer and just stay close and connected to friends and family. You know, poker, similar to comedy, poker can be a somewhat isolating endeavor. And I think it's really important to reconnect with the people that you love Um, You know, several people in my family recently gave birth, so I get to see all the brand new babies and all the smiling faces that surround them and just generally enjoy being with people that I don't get to see very often. I'm going to recommend those of you who play tons and tons of poker, either professionally or semi-professionally, never lose sight of what matters most in this world. It is actually not how well we run with the nuts or anything poker related at all, but it's real life that counts even more. And that's a lesson that I learned many years ago from my poker mentor, Anton Wig, who, although he is incredibly good at poker and also spends a great number of hours perfecting his game theory optimization, if you will. Yeah, he's a GTO guy. There's no two ways about it, but he's a little bit on the exploitative side as well, when he notices players at his table making certain mistakes. But one thing Anton is really known for is never missing a chance to get out there and enjoy life. So we don't want to get too wrapped up in poker. You don't want to become a robot who only thinks, breathes, and sleeps poker. There's a whole world out there for us to see. Of course, that didn't stop me from visiting the casino in Maryland as well as the casino here in Cleveland. And I do have a couple of hands from each, or more accurately, I should say one hand from each casino that I will be sharing on this episode. But before we even do that, I want to share another listener hand, you know, continuing the trend of getting more focused on sharing the hands and the questions that you guys send me and you can submit yours using twitter at clayton comic that's my handle on twitter clayton comic always appreciate the follows the tweets the likes and all the thumbs up (laughs) virtually that we can give each other in today's modern technical world but yeah interestingly enough i chose a hand from another jack casino so this one comes from a Twitter user by the name of A. Schroeder. And A. Schroeder, 1976, was playing at the... Oh, no, I'm wrong. It's not the Jack. It's in Cincinnati, Ohio. So another part of Ohio. But he was actually at the Hard Rock 
hotel and casino there. I had uh, mistakenly thought he was at one of the other Jack properties around the great state of Ohio, but no, he was at the Cincinnati Hard Rock, and he played in a $100 daily tournament. Now, last week, we talked about a listener's bust out from the $10,000 World Series of Poker main event, and today we're going to talk about a $100 daily tournament that took place in the city of Cincinnati, Ohio. So I'm trying to cover a wide range of buy-ins and different player pools just because we want to be reflective of the target market for this podcast. I know that many of you are not out there playing high rollers and 10Ks all the time, or else you'd probably be listening to someone who knows a hell of a lot more about poker than Clayton Fletcher, but you guys are listening to me, so we're going to talk about the tournaments that many of you would be playing in, such as a $100 daily at the Cincinnati Hard Rock in Ohio, USA. So the blinds for this hand are 500 and 1,000, and A. Schroeder writes with a 500 ante. So I'm going to assume that out there in Cincinnati, they do something unusual and have a big blind ante that is equal to the small blind rather than the big blind. I mean, typically we see a 500, 1,000 with 1,000 big blind ante, but he writes 500, 1K, 500. So I'm assuming this is a big blind and that there is 2,000 in the pot before the cards are dealt. And that means Hero has an M of 17 or 34 big blinds if you prefer. There are 28 players left in this daily tournament, which is very clearly a turbo. And the top 14 get paid, which makes me think they had somewhere around 100 to 150 players, depending on how large a percentage of the entries end up in the money. So Hero opens on the button to 2200 holding the 10 of spades nine of spades i have no problem with this i think that it's a mandatory open Uh, i don't think players would necessarily be feeling any bubble pressure at this point but i think that this is the time in a tournament especially a daily tournament with mostly recreational opponents that players do typically start to think about thinking about the bubble so i think say this to mean that there is a decent likelihood of stealing the blinds with this raise size 2.2x on the button. The small blind does fold, but the big blind decides to call, and he's got a very similar 34,000 stack. So heads up, in position, Hero holding the 10 of spades, 9 of spades. So with 5,400 in the pot, The flop comes four of spades, tray of hearts, deuce of diamonds. So four tray deuce with one spade, hero holding the 10 of spades, nine of spades. So we've got two over cards and a back door flush draw and our opponent checks. So guys, do you think this is a spot for a C bet? Well, I did not run this hand through a solver, but I imagine... Had I done so, the solver would have spit out some sort of 50-50, either see bet or don't kind of response. I mean, we will certainly have a lot of strong hands on this board. We will have the nuts when we opened with 6-5. We will have a very strong hand when we opened with ace-5. But at the same time, villain can have those hands as well, particularly the former as with the latter, some players would at least some of the time three bet us pre-flop. So I think that I like checking here. I like betting small here. The only thing I wouldn't prefer is a very large C bet on this board. I mean, think about what kind of bet you would want to make with a hand like pocket eights, pocket nines, pocket tens, all the way up to pocket aces. I think you're going to be wanting action with those hands. So you're trying to get called by just a little piece of the flop or a gut shot, things like that. So a small bet seems to make sense. Uh, In this case, Hero opts to check behind. So it goes check, check on the four trade deuce rainbow flop, which I'm totally cool with. So still 5,400 
in the pot, and the turn comes the ten of diamonds. So our board is now ten, four, tray, deuce, with two diamonds, hero with the ten, nine of spades. And now this ten of diamonds gives us a pair, and villain leads right into us for 5,000 into the 5,400 pot. What to do in hero's shoes? Uh, this is a very strong bet by the big blind, who could have a 10 with a better kicker, could have a straight, in which case we are drawing dead, uh, could have slow played an over pair before the flop. You will see that way more often than you should when you're playing in a $100 daily tournament where everyone loves to be sneaky with their aces and kings, etc. So what to do when he suddenly wakes up and fires almost a pot size bet right into the pre-flop razor on the turn? Well, I think that not having too much information about the uh, big blind here, in fact, A. Schroeder did not provide much information at all. Uh, I lean towards a call. I think that when you finally make top pair in this situation, especially having check behind on the flop, I think it's important to defend your checking behind on the flop range. And it's hard to think of a better hand to do that with than top pair with a nine kicker versus a, a blind hand. Uh, of course, we could be behind and we will be behind pretty often when villain bets this much on the turn. But I'm not ready to fold just yet. And it looks like Hero is on my side. He's calling. So we put in another 5,000 and we're going to see the river with 15,400 in the middle. The river comes the jack of diamonds for a final board of four, tray, deuce, 10, jack with three diamonds. So the backdoor diamond flush draw got there. Hero holding the 10, nine of spades. And Villain continues his aggressive ways, betting 10,000 now into the 15,400 pot. And remember, guys, we started this pot, uh, started this hand with 3,400 in our stack. So calling this bet would mean that we would put in half of that in this hand. Is 10-9 strong enough to lose half my stack on? I don't know. Um, without too much information about the big blind uh, and not really loving the fact that the jack hit on the river, I think that in a tournament with longer blind levels, uh, I'm assuming this is a daily tournament, it's probably 20 minute levels and the blinds go up very aggressively. I think that we need to call here. I don't love it, of course, but I'm not quite ready to fold but only because it's a turbo. To be clear, if this happens in the main event or any tournament where the levels are slow and you've got time to make decisions, I think we can definitely consider folding this hand. But I feel like in a turbo, when you have second pair and there's a decent chance your opponent is bluffing, you just have to go with it. You know That's why nitty players and many professional players prefer those long structures because they don't like to guess and they don't like the variance and they want to wait for the nuts. Well, in a turbo, you can't wait for the nuts. And 10-9 is a little too strong to fold here. Even though Villain is polarizing himself with his very large bet sizing on the turn and then pretty large bet sizing on the river, he's not getting me out. Maybe I'm a station, but I call. Let's see what Hero does. Hero does call and villain bucks. <laughs> so we'll never know what he was bluffing with. I think it's safe to assume that he had like a bear five, maybe a hand like seven five. Highly unlikely he had any type of pair because why would he muck when getting called, right? Even if he had a deuce, I think he would turn it over and say, is a pair good? Uh, yeah, because it's a turbo. So some people will be calling in some spots with ace high. Not that this is one of them, but it's unlikely, in my opinion, that villain just mucked a pair getting called on the river. So I'm thinking he probably had a five or possibly an ace rag that didn't pair up and was just trying to bluff his way through the hand with some kind of straight draw, be it an open ender or a gutter. 
Anyway, that's my guess as to what we were up against. I think that Hero played this hand very well. I like to check back on the flop. I like flat calling on the turn, and I like the Hero call on the river. So way to go, A. Schroeder, 1976. At least in the opinion of one humble podcaster, you done good. All right, now let's talk about a hand that I played out there in Maryland. The place that I play in Maryland is called Maryland Live. It's in a town called Anne Arundel. It's actually attached to a shopping mall that is enormous. I mean, it's on par with the Mall of America in Minnesota. No, not exactly that big, but it's very large with a lot of different quadrants and neighborhoods and districts. And there's lots of places to eat and lots of places to spend your money. So if you're ever in the mood to go shopping and play poker, I can recommend Maryland Live Casino. So they did something that I've never gotten to do before, a live progressive knockout bounty tournament. Yeah, that's right. A PKO like you might find on Poker Stars or ACR, but they did it live. And I think it's pretty clever the way they did it. Each player gets a index card with different squares on it. And whenever you bust someone, your bounty increases just like it does online in a PKO. And so the dollar amount that your bounty is worth ends up being written by the supervisor on that card. So this one, it's a $550 buy-in, which includes a $100 starting bounty. But actually, when you bust someone, you only win $50 and then your bounty goes up by $50 as well. So in the beginning, the bounties are pretty small compared with what you might find online, where typically the bounty amount can be up to half of the total buy-in. So here it's a 550 with only 100 going to the bounty prize pool. But still, they had a nice little guarantee. They had a lot of players. And I was really excited to play in my first ever live action PKO. So here we go, guys. The blinds are 200, 400 with a 400 big blind ante. And we have 46,000 in our stack. At this point, the average is right around 35K. Uh, The action folds to the cutoff. Now, this is a lady that I actually cannot figure out at all. One thing about Maryland Live Casino, a lot of the players know each other. They call each other by their first names. They're all friendly with the dealers. It's got that local neighborhood card room vibe to it. Now, I feel a bit like an outsider whenever I'm in a situation like that, despite the fact that my mother has played at Maryland Live about 100 million times before she retired. But the players there don't really know me. At least I don't think they know me. So based on the fact that this lady uh, seems very chummy with a lot of the other players, I'm going to assume that she's a rag. I'm not sure that she's a pro, but I can tell you I can't figure her out. In the beginning of the tournament, I thought she was super tight. And now here we are only about 90 minutes in, and it seems like she's playing a lot of hands. So it could just be the regular variance of card distribution and she's running into a lot of hands now or whatever, but she's doing well in the tournament. She's got about 40,000. Again, the average is right around 35 and we started with 30 and on her left, a guy that I do have figured out, he's basically a maniac, wild and loose. I'm not sure he's a true maniac, but he's definitely on the loose aggressive side. He's giving a lot of action. He's playing almost every hand. So he flat calls and he's got 80,000 in his stack, which I believe is good for the chip lead at the moment. So he calls on the button and your boy Clayton is in the small blind holding the ace of spades, nine of spades. So it's been raised to 1200 and called. And I decide to go for a squeeze here, but really for value. I think that ace nine suited is actually a pretty strong holding compared with her range for opening the cutoff and obviously this very loose player's range for calling on the button. Uh, I make it 4,400, which I now believe is a mistake in sizing. I think I'm better off making it something like 6,500 here just to get a little bit more fold equity as obviously taking this one down pre is a great result. I only have ace nine suited, even if it is good that certainly my opponents have plenty of equity in the pot. So taking it down would be a big win. 
I think that 4,400 is going to get called too often and I'm not happy with my sizing here uh, as expected <laughs> based on what I just said anyway. Both players do call and we're going to see a, th a flop three ways from out of position. Hero holding the ace of spades, nine of spades. With 14,000 in the middle, the flop comes nine of diamonds, six of spades, tray of hearts. So nine, six, tray, rainbow, hero holding ace nine suited for top pair with a back door flush draw. I think that's certainly good enough for a bet. It's a great flop for my hand. I come out with 6,000 and the lady I couldn't figure out folds and the guy that I think I do have figured out calls. So another great result for hero. I think that ace nine is going to be good. The wide, the vast, the huge majority of the time. So I'm happy that this guy with all the chips is calling my bet when I'm sitting here with top pair, top kicker. Uh, the turn comes the seven of spades. There's now 28,000 in the pot. And this card gives me a flush draw to go with my top pair on the board of nine, six, tray seven with two spades. And there's 28K in the middle. We have 38K in our stack. So how to proceed? I think betting is fine, but in a way I have mixed feelings about this card. I'm delighted to have picked up a flush draw, but a lot of hands do actually get there with a seven on the turn. Uh, you know, there's the eight, five, the 10, eight, and the open-ended five, four, all of which are probably in this opponent's range also, two pair is certainly possible. He could easily have 7-6 or 7-3 or 9-7, although we do block that last one. So I have mixed feelings. I, I like having a flush draw. I also like checking in case we're behind, but also to give our wild, loose, aggressive opponent a chance to take a stab at this pot on those occasions when he merely floated on the flop to see what happens on the turn which is certainly within this player's repertoire, even three-handed on the flop. So for all of those reasons, I opted to pump the brakes and check, although I'm not particularly interested in folding. Uh, I'm hoping in a way that he bets, but I hold on to that hope partly because I have that backdoor flush draw to kind of hang my hat on in case I happen to be behind. So opponent... Bets 12,000 into the 28,000 pot, which I think is a strange sizing for him to choose just about half the pot. Not really sure what he's trying to say with this bet, but I've got way too much going on to fold. And I hope that as you're listening to this, you don't want to fold top pair with the nut flush draw just because this guy says 12K. I pretend that I have a decision and then make the call a few seconds later. The river comes the 10 of diamonds. All right, now there is 52,000 in the middle, and we only have another 26,000 remaining in our stack. So do we like the 10 of diamonds? Certainly not. It means that anyone with an eight now has a straight. If he didn't already have one before, he's got one now with all of his eight X hands. Uh, also, if he did float and try to take the pot away on the turn with a hand like Jack 10 or any 10, he now has our pair of nines beat with the 10 on the river. It's pretty ugly, but we have exactly half the pot remaining. There's 52K in the pot. We've got 26K behind. Uh, we can shove here and possibly get called by worse, but I decided to check and make my own life more difficult. Opponent shoves effectively for my remaining 26,000. Remember, he had us well covered before this hand started. And as much as I don't like the 10 of diamonds on the river, I decide to call simply because this opponent has proven to us that he is very loose and very wild and likes to really get after it and get in there. And also, I feel like he's empowered somewhat by the fact that pretty much everything has gone his way since this tournament started about 90 minutes ago. So we make the call with just a pair of nines and villain 
turns over the ace of hearts, jack of hearts, for no pair at all. And we win this massive pot with our meager pair of nines. So as mentioned, I do recommend you get involved in some of this wild and loose action the next time you visit the great state of Maryland, USA. And now, as promised, I'd like to review a hand that I played at the Jack Casino in Cleveland, Ohio, as part of my (laughs) national tour of local card rooms in the U.S. continues. Uh, This one has a very similar feel, actually, to the casino in Maryland in that most of the players know each other. They all have reputations amongst each other. And the dealers are quite friendly with the players. One of them was even asking one of the other players if he's coming to his barbecue this weekend. So that seems inappropriate. But what do I know? I'm just a guy from New York playing poker in the Midwest. Anyway, this one's a $220 buy-in, which includes a $50 bounty per player. So it's not a mystery bounty or a PKO or any kind of weird bounty. It's just a traditional bounty tournament. And it's pretty much a turbo. The blinds go up every 20 minutes. It's This tournament is going to last about eight or nine hours total. Uh, let's see. The blinds are 200, 400 with a 400 big blind ante relatively early. I think it's level three, so about one hour in. We have 28,000, which is just slightly up from the 25,000 starting stack. Registration is open and players are moving around a bit. Recently seated at my table is a young, schlubby looking, bearded guy, uh, probably in his late 20s, who seems a little too comfortable at the casino. He is openly bragging about how much he won last weekend in the high stakes, as he called it, $5, $10, no limit game that they had, and talking about players who are not present as having been drunk or playing stupidly and pretty much just wanting everyone to know that he is the original OG alpha male in Cleveland, Ohio. So this guy is pretty full of himself and I'm not sure I've ever seen anyone so confident while wearing sweatpants. Uh, He's got about 38,000 in his, in his stack, which just contributes to the narrative that he's the best in the world. Uh, He makes it 12, hundred from middle position and then in the cutoff another young competent player calls with about 30,000 behind so both of these guys have us covered hero starting with 28,000 which is a an m of 28 also known as 70 times the big blind so we are in the big blind holding the king of clubs eight of diamonds And if you want to fold, especially because both of your opponents seem to have a clue, I don't blame you. I'm totally fine with folding here. But I decided to call for 800 more and see what develops. So with 4,200 in the pot, we're going to see a flop three ways from out of position. Hero holding the king of clubs, eight of diamonds. And the flop comes the ace of hearts, king of diamonds, deuce of diamonds. Ace, king, deuce with two diamonds, and we have the eight of diamonds to go along with our pair of kings. Uh, I think leading out with this hand is actually fine. Uh, It's possible that no one has an ace and we can sometimes take it down. We might also be able to get value from hands like queen, jack, and jack, ten that might just want to call with the gut shot and see if they can hit and get lucky. Uh, certainly those hands would be in both of my opponent's ranges, but I decided to check anyway. And the original Razor puts out 2,000 into the 4,200 pot and the other player in position folds. It's up to me and I've got a little too much going on here to fold. But what about check raising? I think check raising on this flop is certainly plus EV. Opponent could easily have One of those gutter balls we just talked about and would probably fold to the check raise. Uh, However, it doesn't really accomplish much else because unless we're going to continue barreling, we're pretty much allowing our opponent to play perfectly. He certainly won't fold any ace to a a check raise, at least not yet. 
and he probably would call with a lot of kings that have us beat as well. So we're basically check raising, but turning the best hand into a bluff a lot certainly isn't the end of the world. But when we're ahead, we're usually way ahead. So it might be better to just let this opponent continue barreling and go ahead and fade that small chance that he happens to hit his gut shot or what have you when we are ahead. So I think calling is best, and that's actually what I did here. So now with 8,200 in the middle, the turn comes the seven of diamonds. So the board is now ace of hearts, king of diamonds, deuce of diamonds, seven of diamonds, hero with king eight, including the eight of diamonds. I decide to check the turn. My plan was to check raise, uh, having a second pair with a flush draw feels like enough for me, especially knowing that this player can double barrel with a lot of hands. He doesn't necessarily have an ace when he barrels again on the turn. So I was looking to check raise, but he foiled my plans by checking behind on the turn. So now with 8,200 still in the pot, the river comes the nine of hearts for a final board of ace of hearts, king of diamonds, deuce of diamonds, seven of diamonds, nine of hearts. So other than that flush draw on the flop, no draws came in, which is kind of important to what I did here on the river. Uh, I checked again going for a check raise. I think that our opponent's range, given the way he plays and the way he played this hand, is pretty much ace-x heavy. And I think that he's a good enough player to not just call down with one pair if he gets check raised on the river. So I kind of made that assessment and I was hoping that he would try to get some thin value with a hand like ace five and that I would be able to punish him for doing so because I didn't think that not knowing me, he would be able to make the hero call. So I went for the check raise bluff on the river with a pair of kings, which is a little bit fancy for <laughs> a little $200 tournament in Cleveland, but it just felt like the move at the time. So I checked and sure enough, opponent bet small 2,500 into the 8,200 pot, at which point I continue with my plan and I check raise to 8,000. And after about 15 seconds, he shook his head and folded his hand. Uh, and afterwards, a very interesting conversation ensued. Uh, but before I tell you that conversation, let me just explain why I didn't just call here. It feels like when he bets the river, he's going to be trying to get value with a hand like Ace X a great amount of the time. I don't think that he would go for value with a hand like King Queen. And I also think that he would make a much larger bet with two pair or better. So 2,500 just felt like, oh, well, I can't check again because I have top pair and I'm going to try to get a little value and stuff like that. So I actually don't think calling this bet is even profitable. But when you turn your hand into a bluff, it does become profitable because I think that my opponent will be folding so much of his range that bets 2,500 on the end. I hope that all makes sense because anyway, he does fold and then he started talking about, you know, it's just, he, he talked about me as though I'm not there. He said, you know, it's just never a bluff when they check raise on the river. He's like, there's probably three players in this whole casino that can check raise bluff on the river. It's just never a bluff. And he's like, I folded ace queen of diamonds. Oh, sorry. He said, I folded ace queen with the ace of diamonds. Obviously ace queen of diamonds would have been the nuts. <laughs> he did not fold the nuts, but he, he claimed to have had ace queen with the ace of diamonds. I think I believe him, although you never really know, unless you see the cards, guys can make up whatever they had as much as they want, especially a player to whom uh, his image and the respect level that he gets from his fellow locals seems to be so important to him. He could easily have made up what he had in his hand, but I, I tend to believe, because that is a plausible hand that he might have played this way. I just thought it was kind of fun that... He assumed because he doesn't know me, I must not be capable of the old check raise bluff on the river in a $200 daily tournament at Jack Casino Cleveland. So that kind of made me chuckle internally, of course. 
Uh, it's interesting to me that I bluffed with a pair because I don't often do that. I probably should do more of that, but I felt like that just made sense in this particular scenario against this exact opponent. I want to know what you guys think. Tweet me at Clayton Comic and let me know what you think of not only this hand that I played at the Jack Casino Cleveland, but also my hand from Maryland Live and A. Schroeder 1976's hand from the Hard Rock in Cincinnati. And for everyone here at Tournament Poker Edge, I'm Clayton Fletcher. Thank you so much for listening. I wanna hold them like they do in Texas plays. Fold them, let them hit me, raise it, baby, stay with me. Lock in intuition, play the cards with babes to start. And after she's been hooked, I'll play the one that's on her heart. Love it, it's not rough, it isn't